It was the afternoon of Monday, April 3, 1995, and according to the timeline drawn up in David Smith's Surrey Hills office the previous month, News Limited executives at this point should have been preparing their terms of surrender to hand to the ARL. Instead, they were in trouble. The ARL's fight back had put News on the back foot, and News Limited boss Ken Cowley had returned from his Hunter Valley weekender to take command. He called Smith into his office with a single order, one which would permanently reshape the game in its birthplace. Within hours, Smith was on a plane, on his way to England to sign up the Rugby Football League. This is ARL Isolated, the 12th chapter in the Rugby League Digest's in-depth investigation of the Super League War. Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams here with Andrew Paskin. How are you, Andy? Good day, mate. It's been a rough couple of chapters for Super League of late. Uh, we've blasted them for some of their errors in their strategy. It's fair to say they get some of their own back in this chapter. Yeah, reading through the prep, it's. Uh, I was wondering if they were going to get something back after the last couple of weeks. <laughs> it's like 40 nil. <laughs> so this episode is going to focus on two strategic master strokes by Super League in the week following the April 1 raid both of them which would have a significant effect on the way the rest of the war played out and one which we can still see the ramifications of to this day. So they were the signing of the ARL's major refereeing talents, which would go on to destabilise the competition for the next year. And more importantly was the signing of the English, New Zealand and eventually the French Pacific Island boards to leave the ARL completely isolated at an international level. That was absolutely seismic when that happened. I could not believe it. And one thing I wanted to discuss from the outset is the way that both of these decisions were carried out on the fly. So we saw in an earlier chapter that there was no mention of the English Rugby League in those Super League planning documents. It was done as a reaction to the ARL's fight back. I don't know what they planned. These planning documents seem to be very uh, dense, but there's not, not too many practical plans coming to fruition. And I think one of the enduring themes of not only this series, but in the three years that we've been doing this show together is rugby league administration. And a lot of the time we're trashing that or questioning some of the decisions being made. And this is a reversal of that where we can see administrators making the right decision, something that would reshape the game and get them back on the front foot. And the fact that both of these decisions were done on the fly, there's something so beautifully rugby league about <laughs> Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. It's like they spent all this time carefully putting a plan together, <laughs> forget about or choose to ignore some of the most fundamental elements, and yet suddenly in a bind they have to do something and they make the exact right decision, something that probably should have been in the plan all along. But isn't it the ultimate rugby league paradox? It's the most reactionary slow to move administration by reputation, but they're always doing things on the fly really quickly. Exactly. And getting yeah, it done. Yeah. I mean, look at what we talked about rugby league in the 70s. Big on ideas, but willing to sit on their hands, hampered by a Byzantine administrative structure, sees the game going rapidly downwards. Suddenly the Kevin Humphreys scandal emerges. They're forced into action, put into place a number of developments which restore rugby league and put it in a position a decade later for super league yeah and when you think about it like that it's not that much of a stretch to see in this what we love most about rugby league when we think about on the field you know it's not the robotic coach within a millimeter of their lives players and and teams that we like it's the you know the joey down the blind it's the brett kenny dummy step you know it's the entertainers (laughs) exactly and so it's only natural then that rugby league men will administer in the same spirit (laughs) are you saying that rugby league administrators administer what's in front of them (laughs) i am you know (laughs) they administer on the fly we get tina turner careful planning gets us blow that whistle ref (laughs) poor thomas (laughs) so with that we're going to get into it and obviously the decision of the english and new zealand boards had the bigger impact and is the more important development it gives us the title of this chapter So for that reason, we're going to save that for the back half of this episode and start off with the referees. And with this, there are competing 
accounts as to whether Super League had originally planned to include the referees or not. So a representative for Bill Harrigan, the lawyers Karras and Karen Donis, they maintain that they went to Super League with a number of players and referees they represented, including Bill Harrigan, Steve Clark, Graham Annesley. And at that point, in their words, Super League hadn't considered the referees. Can I just say, my recollection of it as a teenager, I thought, you know what, this goes to show how advanced they were. They were looking after the referees early on. They had that as their number one tent pole. It turns out they hadn't even thought of it. Well, that's one account. So in John Rebo's words, signing up the referees was always part of our plan. I really enjoyed my dialogue with them. They cared about the game, but they were being left out in the cold. We gave them the chance to have a say in the game and have some sort of career path. So that's John Rebo's account. So I really admire that, but it doesn't jive with the other account. It doesn't. And if I was going to choose one, I would choose the other one. I think, yes, referees were always a part of the Super League plan because referees are needed to run the game. You have to remember that in their plan, they didn't see two competitions running as being a possibility. (laughs) Their plan was all about ARL capitulation. So referees were an afterthought because they didn't think there'd be a need to sign up refs. Give them A plus on positive thinking though. And it's funny, Bill Harrigan, who in, in my mind was so representative of the Super League war. Me too. Seeing him in that black and white like the American style uniform. And he already had the lariness and, and, you know, he grew his hair out for Super League. That, that was the ultimate. Yeah. <laughs> that was when an era when long hair was like number one for Larry. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he became such an advocate for Super League. So it's reading his account makes me think even more that the referees weren't part of the original plan. So in his words, he Super League contacted them. He got the offer. But when he asked them about what their program was going to be, all the rest of it, it was clear that John Rebo hadn't put any thought into the development of referees or how the system was going to work. Is this not the typical ex-player, just general obliviousness and contempt for referees work? Yeah, exactly. And this carries on both sides, which we're going to see as we get into this. I can't believe that they treat them so badly still. To this day, like nothing's changed. They're the, the only sector of the game who is so consistently hung out to dry There seems to be no support from players, coaches, administration, journalists. Nothing. Every sector of the game. (laughs) Like rugby league's about closing ranks. And (laughs) and this is the complete opposite. Anything, Anytime anything happens. (laughs) It's opening ranks. And I should add at the start that we're doing this out of chronology. The referees sign with Super League after the international developments. I wonder if that contributed to any of their decision. I think it definitely did. And we're going to see that from a couple of angles. So Super League approached the referees with an offer. Uh, So Bill Harrigan was to be the best paid of the referees. The offer from Super League was a $65,000 salary, fully serviced car, a mobile phone, $1,000 a match, and bonuses for representatives and finals. What about the year when a mobile phone was a big (laughs) perk? And at that point, the referees were getting paid by the ARL about $500 a game. So there was no full-time referees. They all had full-time jobs and refereed on weekends. So this was a big change. But as Bill Harrigan puts it, I felt like I'd sold myself short knowing what my manager thought I'd get, but it was better than my pay packet from the cops and I was keen to referee full-time. It's worth noting for the younger listeners how big a deal Bill Harrigan was. Yeah, and I think way back in the early days of the show, I mentioned that There hasn't been a referee like him since. No. There's certainly been plenty before, but you can't think of that dominant, dominant referee since Bill Harrigan. He had the swagger as opposed to the whiny school teacher sort of vibe. That cop swagger, which helped him and also hurt him. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I must say, I was one of those hacks in the 90s that would regularly say, oh, Harrigan, he just has to make it all about him. (laughs) Great referee. But from the moment he retired from being an active referee, you felt that loss instantly on the field. Yeah. But that's not denigrating some of the other top refs. No, exactly. It's just he was the pin-up boy or whatever. So with that, with a Super League offer in place, the ARL wanted to make sure that their refereeing stock was kept in-house. And this again speaks of the contempt in which referees are held in the game. That The first thing Mick Stone did, who was the, the ref's boss at the time, assemble the referees the first thing he said was to issue them a warning that they would be banned from the ARL if they signed with Super League so you wouldn't see the players getting that ultimatum first you know they'd get the offer first and then oh by the way 
But with the referees, it was reversed. He then did go to say, uh, in Bill Harrigan's words, with a grin and a wink, he mentioned there was a honeypot for those who signed up. On hearing that, I reckon we all started thinking of what we'd do with our cash. <laughs> what do you think Harrigan was thinking of buying? I reckon he was thinking of buying a, a speedboat. <laughs> a cigarette boat. As it turned out, those hopes weren't going to be realised, as I'll read Harrigan's words here. My hopes were heightened after I introduced myself to one of the solicitors, and he lowered his voice and said I was going to be the highest paid of all the referees. You little ripper, I thought. I felt as if I'd won lotto. I became really excited. The solicitor began to write a five and then a zero on a blank part of my contract. You beauty, I said, thinking of the five-figured contracts they'd been paying unknown junior footballers who might not even end up playing grade football. They're going to pay me 50 grand, I thought. Finally, I'd be able to focus on refereeing and not have to worry about trying to juggle my full-time police work as well. But the solicitor finished at $5,000 and I was shocked. You've forgotten the zero, mate, I said, pointing to the paper. Now, who thought this was a good idea? Just to slap them in the face? Yeah. That's the thing. Not only do you issue them with this threat, but then you deliver them an offer below condescending. Crazy. The war had been out in the open for a couple of weeks by that point. We knew all the crazy money being thrown around on both sides. Surely the ARL could have imagined that the Super League offer was higher than... 5,000. But just this attitude where it's like, you know, it's their honour to referee the game. It's like, you know what I mean? It's the most thankless job in the world. Yeah. And they just treat them like garbage. And this is one of the biggest advantages Super League had across the war as a whole, capitalising on ingrained bitterness towards the ARL that had manifested at all levels of the game. So Bill Harrigan's response is typical. The only people who seemed to be forgotten amid the mad rush were the referees and touch judges. And wasn't that a surprise? Touch judges were a distant... No, yeah. <laughs> it's just quietly. But so you had 15-year-old kids being you know, ARL executives driving to their school and paying them $15,000 <laughs> at recess. <laughs> Sausage roll and sauce and 15 grand. But even from the Super League side, even though the top referees at least were getting the chance to be professional full-time and being paid something approaching what they were worth, they were still clearly being shortchanged. So after the initial court, case when the referees were still unable to referee in the ARL but didn't have an on-field role in Super League. They were given various administrative tasks. So Bill Harrigan and Steve Clark, one of their jobs was to go to the Super League offices and do you know various admin stuff. That's quite degrading. So they were seeing some of the, the contract figures that were being paid out and Harrigan recounts that reserve grade Penrith players were getting paid 80,000, 200,000. It's an ARL style manoeuvre. It's yeah. like, just let them sit at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need them to be shuffling paper. <laughs> Penny wise, pound foolish, if, I, if I've ever seen it. So it's not all, all they were asked to do, as we'll get to. But of course, not all the referees did go. So. I mean, this would have been the ideal time for guys waiting for their opportunity to go, well, they're going to go, so I'm going to stay. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. So Eddie Ward was one who stayed. So he was coming to the end of his time as a referee. So he stayed for that reason. He thought that if they were gone, he'd get the chance to referee the big games, which he subsequently went on to do. Good ref. Good ref, but it, it's funny. Like he had the, the blocker incident was his main you know, notoriety, the hand padding before 1995. I didn't really know him until 1995. Yeah, that's what made him. You can't really blame him for blocker padding yeah. your hand. I mean, <laughs> it happened to anybody. And funnily enough, uh, in, in Harrigan's account, David Manson, who was another who I hadn't really heard of until 1995. Harrigan says that he missed out because he tried to play both sides <laughs> off against each other. <laughs> and so the reason that Eddie Ward and David Manson were able to rise to prominence was because the referees who had signed with Super League were banned from officiating any ARL games. So knowing that he was about to make the decision and the ramifications of, of that, Bill Harrigan looked at his upcoming schedule. His next match was one between Cronulla and Balmain at Shark Park, which wasn't much of a game. The game after that was Canterbury versus Canberra, the grand final recap. So he thought, all right, well, I'm going to have that as my ARL swan song. After that, I'm going to announce my decision and <laughs> you know, be gone from the ARL. So with that, with Harrigan gone, Steve Clark, Tim Mander, Graham Annesley, the ARL had lost some of their most experienced refereeing talents. Graham Mansell is an interesting one. Look at his career post this. The getting involved with News Limited, I think it was opened a few corporate doors for old Graham. Yeah, yeah, and he's not alone there. Yeah. But so the inevitable result was what we talked about when we 
discussed the shameful behavior of Bob Fulton and Phil Gould throughout that 1995 season, constantly attacking the referees in the press. Teams were no doubt game planning for the referees, trying to take advantage of unexperienced referees. So rather than coach your side to play better football, you're going to try to exploit (laughs) the referees. And so it, it really made a difficult situation much worse. We've We've placed the blame on Bozo and Gus, rightly so. But what about the ARL? Did they have to ban the referees? I think that's overkill. It's actually, it's easier to have it done after the fact. I mean, it's easy to sit back and judge, but uh, I can sort of see their logic as well. But I think it comes back down to that lack of respect for referees. They didn't see it as a problem to be losing a thousand games worth of refereeing talent in one hit. It's like you always say, if you're not hearing about them, they're doing a good job. And then when, when they're not there, you really notice it. Yeah. So I think it was a miscalculation. And again, I, I think it comes down to they they just didn't consider that it would come back to harm them. I don't know how though. I suppose they had a lot on their plate as well. But... <laughs> <laughs> and it did add to the toxicity and this was both internal and external. So Bill Harrigan recounts ARL ground manager, Eric Cox, approach him at Cogra Oval one day. So... Harrigan was there to see Paul McBlain, who stayed loyal to the ARL, went to wish him well in the match, went to head into the referee's dressing room, to which he was confronted by an angry Eric Cox, who for many (laughs) years had been a referee's boss and had helped to bring referees like Bill Harrigan through. So in Bill Harrigan's words, Then I heard someone yell out a barrage of foul language that would have made a wharfy blush. I turned around and saw Eric pointing at me. His face was beetroot red and he ripped into me. You're not welcome. You're a super league lowlife. Where's your loyalty, you so-and-so? Get out of here. Eric made it painfully clear he thought my ties with Murdoch's camp meant I didn't deserve to be at an ARL game. And I was rattled. I tried to tell Eric we were still friends, but that notion was quickly shot down. You've lost the plot, Eric, I said after another barrage. I thought I was in your stable. And that set him off. He screamed I was no mate of his and for me to rack off. <laughs> Cox later that day uh, went on to ABC Radio and said, Listen, I fought in World War II and we had to dig into the trenches. We fought for this country and people like him don't deserve to live in this country that we fought for in the trenches. He's a disgrace. (laughs) That's maybe going overboard there. (laughs) But thankfully, this is one situation where bridges were mended and Harrigan and Cox repaired their relationship. So in Harrigan's words... He has done way too much for my career and development for me to hold a grudge. Eric is Eric. He's a hard head who can become blinded by emotion, but I also know he has a good heart. Eric now works for the NRL. I should say this is an older book. Eric Cox has since passed away. And will tell you he has only one allegiance to the game of rugby league. It's those guys that built rugby league. Mm. And it's those guys that also strangled it. Yeah. <laughs> but that uh, toxicity got public as well. Uh, and he's probably not the only one, but... You could see the damage it was doing when Bill Harrigan's kids at school were were getting teased. Just crazy. Crazy, but you have to admire the uh, ingenuity of these schoolyard bullies (laughs) who, to Bill Harrigan's older son, Matthew, were chanting out Paxton to him. For some of the younger listeners, at this time, the Paxton family... Shane and Bindi. Shane, Bindi and a third one were stars of a current affair for refusing to take jobs that were offered to them. This shows you the quaintness of this time. In 1995, the entire nation could unite to (laughs) be outraged over a a family of unemployed teenagers on a current affair. There's nothing funnier than school kids. This is the way they insult each other. (laughs) So with that, with no place for him in the ARL, Bill Harrigan and his fellow referees wanted to stay match fit. So initially they approached schools to try to get involved there but were told that the schools feared ramifications from the ARL if they allowed it so that was a no-go god if the ARL are putting sanctions on schools <laughs> so with that they went to New Zealand and Papua New Guinea so Bill Harrigan was refereeing in the local comps there that's really cool and this is something that Super League uh, did really well so as Harrigan says it I'd arrive in Auckland on Friday night and catch a flight the next morning to the province I was refereeing in, such as Hawke's Bay or Taranaki. I'd meet with the local referees and they always had something set up in addition to the game, whether it was a seminar ready to start or going off to watch a couple of them run around the park refereeing. Saturday evening usually meant a dinner with the refs and their partners. It was a real buzz refereeing in those countries. Very cool. And then in 1996, once it was clear that there'd be no Super League in Australia that year, Harrigan actually went over to England and was refereeing games there. 
got some experience using video ref, which would help for when Super League eventually started in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So the reason Harrigan was able to go to New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and then England was the development for which this chapter was named, the decision of the English League to accept News Limited's offer to join Super League. So as we've said, this wasn't part of the original Super League battle plan, but it didn't come out of nowhere. So David Smith had been in England the previous year looking at the state of the English game and seeing what their options were. So it was clear that Super League knew that getting the rest of the world on board was the way to go with Super League. It was part of their vision, the global vision. But again, I think it comes down to the fact that they didn't think that there'd be an ARL that they'd have to deal with. They thought, let's sort out Australia and we can negotiate with the rest of the world. So for all News Limited talk about this global vision and the rest of it, their reasons for launching this raid in early April 1995 do come down to that strategic aspect. So I'm going to read it in Ken Arthurson's words. This is from Roy Masters, Inside Out. This was actually Arthurson's contribution to a publication put out by English Rugby League fans disappointed with the way the situation went, uh, a publication called Merging on the Ridiculous. <laughs> we suspect it was never the intention of News Corporation to run a competition in Australia or Great Britain. We believe that News Corporation hoped to cripple the ARL by signing elite players and forcing the ARL to the negotiating table to obtain what they really wanted, Australian pay TV rights for Rugby League. When the ARL fought back and signed in excess of 400 players, including a large percentage of the elite juniors, News Corp were forced to adopt other tactics. What the Super League administrators did was focus their attention on Great Britain, not because they wished to involve you in their elite competition, but merely to overcome a powerful disincentive for players switching to Super League, namely the loss of the privilege of representing their country. And so with that, David Smith was sent to England. And you've got to say, this is probably his greatest moment in the Super League war. <laughs> so he did arrive to a game that was on its knees in that country. Maybe it was an easy sell. But he still got the job done. It's funny because like, I got into the English game for the 94 tour. I was watching the VHS tapes over and over. It was really cool to me. I didn't realize it was so dire at the time. Yeah. So Smith's immediate role was to court the RFL boss, Morris Lindsay, and more importantly, to stop him from letting Ken Arthurson know what was going on. So he met him in Leeds in a chauffeur-driven limousine, plied with prawns and champagne, and, and kept a close watch telling him what the Super League vision was and sticking on him to make sure there was no opportunity for Lindsay to speak to Arthurson. Well, wow. because those two were quite close, right? Yeah, and that's something that even though they were in opposition and that opposition got quite heated, there was a mutual respect there that the Super League war didn't kill. But <laughs> poor David Smith. This is possibly the most David Smith quote ever. So um, this is from Roy Masters' book Inside Out when he's talking about Morris Lindsay. Surprisingly, during our October 1995 interview, Lindsay forgot the name of the man who delivered him £87 million six months earlier, <laughs> first calling him White. <laughs> the history of rugby league name gaffes is astonishing. <laughs> so by the time he met Smith, Morris Lindsay had already been clued on to Super League and the possibilities of an English connection there uh, after hearing about it from B-Sky B-Boss Sam Chisholm. And this led to some speculation that Lindsay was in on the loop the whole time. His relationship with the Broncos bosses, which was forged during the previous year's World Club Challenge, added to that. So again, there's a bit of intrigue and an idea that he was in on it in advance. That's something that he categorically refutes, saying the first he heard of it was <laughs> Tuesday, April 4, <laughs> accounting for the, the timeline there. It should be called the first I heard of it war. <laughs> But it, as we're going to get into, it was a, a fairly easy sell. And we're going to examine it from the English side. But first, I want to look at the immediate fallout in Australia. So Thursday, April 6, was when the decision was able to be announced uh, by Ken Cowley in Australia. And this was at a press conference at the Sheridan on the Park in Sydney. A press conference chaired by Clean Up Australia founder and experienced yachtsman Ian Cannon <laughs> again with the yachting connection he was big back then huh? he was big I think this will be the last yacht captain we talk about going forward but I can't promise that I've got four chapters on Dennis Connor <laughs> what are you talking about so he introduced Ken Cowley also on stage were Mal Meninga John Rebo and New Zealand boss Graham Carden and at that conference Cowley was able to announce the signing of both the English and New Zealand leagues which, along with Newcastle, it's always sold as this 
knockout blow, which ended up not being a knockout blow. That's for very different reasons than Newcastle, who obviously stayed loyal. But I want to ask you, why wasn't it a knockout blow? I can't answer it. I thought it was at the time. All I can come down to is the state of international football at the time. Yeah, it just really showed, because I just thought everybody loved international league like I did. I thought test matches were the greatest thing in the world. After that, I thought, hang on, a lot of people don't really care about this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if they'd have signed the QRL and suddenly state of origin was going to be a yeah. super concept, yeah, yeah. that might have been the knockout blow. Yeah. By the way, how would you feel if you were Freddie and Chief? Yeah. You just signed up, you got a truckload of money, but then your test captaincy's off the... Uh... Yeah, exactly. So th- that was a-, a massive day in rugby league in Australia. And at the time, you're right, it did seem like it was game over. This announcement was hours before the infamous footy show appearance of John Rebo and Ken Arthurson. That's which- what uh, set the fuse. Exactly. And that's coming up in a chapter very soon. But you have to think that announcement would have made that situation even more volatile. But I want to look at it from the other angle. So it's always been talked about as this knockout blow for the ARL. But if Super League didn't get that signing, would it have been a knockout blow for them? You already had this extensive fight back. You had the very real possibility of Ricky Stewart going back to the ARL. I can't say for sure that without that international decision, he would have. But he'd been promised the ARL captaincy. He obviously was very invested in playing for Australia and captaining Australia. It's obviously different if you're pitching a global vision and you haven't got global <laughs> global uh, access. Exactly. So I think the Stewart decision alone would have really destabilised things. It may have stopped later players, later clubs from signing with Super League. It might have forced compromise talks from Super League in that first week from a much weaker bargaining position than they thought they were going to be in. And again, this is speculation. Maybe nothing does change. We saw on the ARL side that it seemed like there was just momentum behind it continuing on to what we eventually got. Yeah. But you're right with that global vision. That is how Super League was sold. And evidence from other sports shows that international competition is the easiest and most effective way to sell your sport. So this saga inevitably draws a lot of unanswerable questions. And maybe there's no point discussing them, but I I do like to bring them up and give everyone the chance to think about this and, and see if they think there would have been a different outcome. Yeah, interesting, man. What's interesting to me um, is the sort of big brother, little brother relationship between Australia and England. And then they're like making them the whipping boys for three decades and they're like, well, why aren't you staying loyal? <laughs> <laughs> but it's also funny that that balance of power, it seemed to shift off the field at around the same time that it did on the field. Yeah. So, you know, Australia finally wins... And Ashes in England in 63 after 50 years. And then basically from almost that point on, they're the the dominant power on and off the field. Yeah. So now let's look at it from the English side. And I should say at the outset that what is in scope in this is the immediate decision. So obviously Super League beginning in England is its own chapter. That'll come in our second series when we look at 1996 and beyond. So in this chapter, we're focusing very much on the immediate. So we're not going to go into too much detail about mergers and failed mergers and who was in and who was out. We're just going to have a look at the broader state of the game in England. And as we said, that state of the game was a poor one in 1995. So by some reports, 28 of 32 clubs were insolvent. That's better than the Australian game. (laughs) (laughs) There was a real haves and have-nots, again, very similar to the Australian game. You had Morris Lindsay kind of like this mirror image to Arco where he came from Wigan, then went on to be boss of the league, and there was a, always a perception of favoritism and that, you know, he was he was still Wigan's guy. Is that a global rugby league trope, the hatred of glamour clubs? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's sport in general, but it seems particularly yeah. like, strong in rugby league. I wonder if it's like all over in every comp, like in Fiji, they're like, oh, that's server, mate. Server's at all the play. <laughs> and that thing of haves and have-nots uh, was reinforced when... So the decision to... Go with Super League was officially ratified on the Saturday morning. So the member clubs of the RFL met in Wigan to decide whether they were going to go with Super League or not. Again, within a few days. Yeah, but that decision was actually made in Huddersfield on the Friday night with the bosses of the prospective Super League clubs meeting privately to basically carve out rugby league in the country. That allowed News Limited to put out a press conference announcing the English board's decision before that meeting had even happened. (laughs) And so that offer was 
clearly one that was going to be too good to refuse for an English board that was struggling. So it gave them the TV presence. It gave them a sorely needed cash injection. They might as well have announced the press conference when they first made the offer because there was little chance that it was going to go any other way. Ken Arthurson appealed to his old friend Morris Lindsay to give them time and give the ARL a chance to do something. Uh, in Lindsay's words, he said, Oh, gee, mate, it's so difficult and all the rest of it. Don't do it. I told him, Ken, I'm telling you, if I say no, they'll just throw Lindsay out on the street. I mean, the club's in England, not News Corporation. Get anybody at this end in the negotiation seat and they'll sign up for the $75 million. So he knew then that it was almost certain we were going to sign quickly. And then he sent me a fax the next day saying, Look, please read out my message to the clubs. When you do have a meeting, ask them not to sign until I come over. Wow. So that was Arthurson's plea. Met with the deaf ears that Lindsay warned him it would be. So Leeds boss Ron Tiemann said, We should thank Mr. Arthurson for his concern. But let's ask ourselves, what would he do if the position was reversed? Good question. And with that, the decision was made. And it was a, a windfall for the players. It saved the clubs. Obviously, it was to kill some clubs and destabilize the competition in fundamental ways. But that's for another day. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about Morris Lindsay, who a, a very devi divisive figure in English rugby league. And I, I'd love to get some English perspective on Morris Lindsay. Me too. Like I've always been interested in him because it's a name that I've, I've heard of my whole life. Really colorful character. Uh, had a long stint, long and very successful stint as Wigan boss before taking over the job at the RFL. Well, if we say that Brad Mellon's a classic Australian rugby league name, I think Morris Lindsay is a classic English name. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, instrumental in getting the World Club Challenge started in 1987. So from a global perspective, he was clearly interested in that long predating Super League. That's actually very innovative. Uh, it's unfortunately that it's gone from weakness to weakness, yeah. but I uh, always loved it. And immediately he came out on the front foot about the decision and met with resistance from some rugby league fans had this to say. Now, this, this was in London's Daily Telegraph. The, the doubters were viewed as loudmouthed, ignorant oafs. They are never satisfied. They don't realize change is essential for respect and recognition. Instead of pursuing a unified goal, they indulge in nostalgia. That's fine, but it doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> and so with that, he became a very enthusiastic spokesman for Super League, but preserved his relationship with Arthurson to the point that he came out to Australia trying to get some compromise talks going and, and trying to maybe salvage the situation. You can question your motives in doing that all you want, but... This comment sums it up nicely. This is from Morris Lindsay in Roy Master's book. Having just signed up myself, I was walking there, literally walk walking into the lion's den. But I wanted to do it because I wanted to bring about an early reconciliation if I could. I went from Ken Arthurson's office to Ken Cowley's office, and Ken Cowley was receptive to peace. I left Australia thinking that there might be some mileage there. I was horrified when I got back to see people I've never met, like Graham Richardson, making very volatile statements. The hawks on the ARL side seemed to want war. They were treating it like a premiership playoff, as opposed to a consideration of a possible base for the next hundred years. Well, you bring warlords in, what do you get? <laughs> you get war. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and we're going to hear a lot more about Morris Lindsay as we go along throughout the war. So especially in 1996, he had a very key role to play once Burchett's decision in the same Supreme Court was made. Another aspect of Morris Lindsay, and this is another one of those unanswerable questions, is he was a outspoken believer that rugby league and rugby union would and probably should eventually be amalgamated potential hybrid game <laughs> well uh, at least he at least he came to it from a position of a rugby league man so he said if in five years time we remain a great game but there's a proposal on the table to consider combining the codes i'd listen providing we are not expected to go back on bend and knee to the so-called mother code so at least he would have fought for rugby league but when you have Morris Lindsay, the English boss, when you have Paul Morgan at the Broncos, someone who long suggests that they should get together uh, and had engaged in talk. So he and the Australian Rugby Union chairman, Leo Williams, both happened to also be shareholders in the Brisbane Bullets. So they had a relationship there. <laughs> There's been too much envy on this one. <laughs> uh, it's not the last of it, don't worry. <laughs> so the two of them had informal merger talks about the time of the 1995 Rugby Union World Cup with Paul Morgan saying, there's a difference of opinion between Leo and me as to which code will run the one rugby, but that's the only thing we differ on. 
Then you had John Rebo coming out and saying that a hybrid game will probably happen, but thought it might take 10 to 20 years. I wish it had happened back then. Now it would be over it, you know, but I mean, pretty much would it have to be 95% league on the field because <laughs> it's unwatchable, the uh, union. So. so this is the climate we were in. And then on top of that, once Rupert Murdoch signs up Rugby Union in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, which we have an episode on those developments. As much as I don't like to talk about Rugby Union, it's something quite pivotal to the Super League war, so that will be upcoming. So with all that, there was a real feeling in the air that Super League was actually a front for the amalgamating of Rugby League into Rugby Union, which did nothing but inflame the situation further. And Arthurson's mutual respect with Morris Lindsay didn't extend to the rest of the ARL. Uh, John Quayle had this to say about Morris Lindsay. What a farce that Morris Lindsay has now become the spokesman for Murdoch League in Australia. This man who sold out the game in the blink of an eye in England and who sold out the international game. Where is John Rebo? Have they done so much damage to the game that they feel they've got to call on someone like Morris Lindsay to try to rectify it? Someone who has no regard whatsoever for Australia? Well, Morris, despite what you might think, the war hasn't even started in Australia. The game will never be lost here. We will never sell out the way you did. Vitriolic. Well, let's look at it then. Let's look at it in hindsight. Look at the English game now. I mean, it's not exactly flying high on the whole beat. Would it still be here if not for Super League? Well, that's a very real question. But something that struck me in the preparing for this episode was reading a line in Mike Coleman's Super League book. The British code was centred just as it had been when founded a century before in the north of the country. 25 years on, most of the efforts at expanding beyond that base have struggled along rather than you know, been going gangbusters. We've mm-hmm. had failed French teams and Welsh teams and London teams. At least they're trying something. They're trying something. And obviously it all seems to be on the upswing, but whether all that is sustainable, we'll see. So once the decision was made, the new the new world order could start and the English league got together to try to work out what was going to happen. And that involved merging sides and there was a lot of jockeying p- for position and all the rest of it. And again, I don't want to get into it at this point because... We can't start wading into that muck yet, but don't worry, we're going to get knee deep in that muck at a later point. It's getting way too nasty for my liking already. (laughs) So let's let's retreat from the nastiness then and, and just look at some of the practical implications of the decision of England to sign with Super League. The first one was the move from Winter League to Summer League. And this is something that had been talked about for some time. Super League didn't invent this idea. It was something that had been discussed, but met with that expected resistance. So in the Rugby League week, following the announcement of the English decision to sign with Super League and switch to Summer Rugby League, this uh, column by English correspondent Dave Hadfield gives you an idea about this argument. Perhaps the strangest mystery, though, was the sudden conversion of Leeds to the idea of Summer League. Dead against it. Always have been. Dead against any revamp that involved Summer League. Had to be. So firmly, in fact, that they were muttering about an injunction to stop any immediate move to bring it in. But lo and behold, up went their representative's hand, along with the rest, when the whole Murdoch plan was voted in. So now the club must do what has always claimed was impossible by combining league with test and county cricket at Headingley during the English summer. It should be interesting. I don't know why they didn't want to go to summer. It's funny because I'll just outline this. This is also in Roy Masters' book. This uh, was a RFL report called Summer Rugby that outlined seven key advantages to switching to Summer Rugby League. So one, climate. 37 matches postponed in the 1992-93 season. Insane. Two, travel. Players and supporters able to travel during daylight. Three, marketing. Pre-match entertainment could be conducted on a larger scale. Four, upkeep of playing surfaces. A more constant and reliable playing surface leading to better quality football. Five, this is perhaps the biggest one in the whole thing. No competition from soccer and rugby. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus Christ. Six, sponsorship. Greater pre and post-match entertainment ought to result in increased average expenditure per person at bars and shops. Seven, international competition. The ability to restructure the international competitions would be available if all the major playing nations commenced and ended their playing seasons at approximately the same time. But it's funny because that last one is one that's really contested. Was this going to be good or bad for international football? And on that opening weekend roadshow in 1995, the question of England switching to Summer Rugby League came up. And you have to remember, this is a month before 
Super League was announced. This is a month before any talks had occurred between Super League and the English League. Ken Arthurson was asked the question about the developments in England about the fact they may switch and said, I wonder why you'd even think of doing that. It would mean the end of Kangaroo and British Lions tours as we know them. See, when I heard about it as a kid, I was devastated for that very reason and also for players coming over here and then going to England. I love that. You know, Brett Kenny going over to Wigan or Sterling to Hull and, you know, whatever. That was so cool. And then vice versa, Andy Courier or Martin Fire or Ellery, yep. Ellery Hanley. And I think, well, that's all over now. And then now look at it. We've got all these great palms out here. Exactly. And the thing is, both of those things were over anyway. Like yeah. The, the Kangaroo Tour could not continue as it had been. The world was changing and there, there wasn't going to be... We'd already saw that the 98 Tour was, wasn't going to be like just a, a hit and run kind of tour. But it wasn't going to be the tour of old. You wouldn't be playing all, you know, a club three, size. Yeah, <laughs> Cumbria. Yeah. <laughs> so it was already on the cards, but Super League was the impetus to make it happen. These decisions, which involve major changes to the game, obviously met with a lot of backlash. And I want to read this statement from Morris Lindsay because it's so true of rugby league in England and Australia. And if rugby league ever takes off in Namibia, it will <laughs> probably be the same there because I think it's in the DNA. A lot of people in England resist change, and it's hard to explain because throughout the 100-year history of rugby league, there has been constant change. 15 men to 13, dropping the flankers, removing the line-out, the play the ball, the limited tackle rule, the handover rule, all of those. Every time it came out, it caused a furor and caused a debate. So there was a fault in that quote. Uh, a lot of people in Northern England were resistant <laughs> to change. <laughs> so with all this, it was clear that relationships between Australia and England weren't going to be the same if the ARL survived. And so it was a, a strange time for Ken Arthurson to be heading to England for a meeting of the international board, as he did at the end of April. And basically, the developments in Super League essentially removed all talking points off the table but the 1995 World Cup. It's miraculous that that World Cup escaped without too much embarrassment. Mm. And, and was in like... Hindsight. Escape with not only escaped without embarrassment, but became a real turning point for international yeah, rugby league. Yeah, from what I was panicking before that came about. But and so at that point, the international board there was a chance that ARL players could have been excluded from <laughs> the World Cup. Like this was the crazy situation we were in, where every every country had signed with Super League, but Australia were able to omit Super League players and just have the ARL there. I wish they weren't so petty on that, but. All's fair in hate and war. Exactly. And and that is also a matter for another chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but what the ARL did was fight back. Just as they had in Australia, they decided to go after England. And when you hear like a cliche about the Super League war is that both sides were as bad as each other. That line of argument. And this situation is one where you can really see where that comes from. So when the announcement that the English board had signed with Super League came out, one account says that Bob Fulton sitting with Ken Arthurson said, we're fucked. But Fulton roundly disputes that accusation and says, I said, let's go to England. Let's get into England. Let's cut them to pieces over there. Buy their players. They haven't got a national team. So they can't play them against anybody. That was my reaction. So do a Super League on England. And this is the thing that the ARL were out in force about how Super League was immoral and going after England because, and they didn't care about the English game. All they wanted to do was to get pay TV rights. And you hear Fulton talking about that all they wanted to do was crush the English rugby league <laughs> if it could help their own fight. Yeah. Like the hypocrisy of that statement, like he cared as little as Super League about English football at best. Yeah. But again, if you stick in, stick in a hornet's nest, the hornets are going to be agitated. <laughs> And think about it from the English club's perspective. They're struggling. They have found this saviour. Everything's sweet. They can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Here comes Bozo and Arco to jam rocks into that tunnel. To... <laughs> <laughs> so this was Morris Lindsay's comment on what the ARL were doing. In the north of England, we're ready for liftoff. Except every day, someone else representing Australia is trying to screw the game. <laughs> These efforts, including attempts to stop British players from playing for their national sides. So Gladys Craven in the Herald obtained an affidavit from a 19-year-old Welsh player, Reese Harris, who says he was offered $50,000 to not play international Super League for five years. That's outrageous. 
Frank Stanton, who uh, was Manly chief executive at the time and had visited England, he was the one who is said to have made that offer. He denies it. He said that no offer was made. Uh, so we've got that versus a signed affidavit. So That is sickening. Yeah. And beyond that, what the ARL did was to try to sign some of the, the best English talent. So they signed Jason Robinson on a $2.5 million contract. Got some other players. Gary Connolly was still at the top of his game. Two best players, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. And for all they did, for all the signings they made, it didn't really seem to have much of an effect. So you had Jason Robinson eventually turning his back on the ARL deal anyway. When you look at the players who came out to Australia, we got Lee Jackson, Ellery Hanley, well past his prime. Yeah. It's so funny, the Ellery Hanley thing. Like, I knew he came back and played at the Tigers in this time, but I have no memory of watching him play. Nor have I. It's like... And, and he was like my rugby league hero in 1988. And I just, I cannot remember watching him in 96. No, me either. Another a few players like Jason Robinson, like Gary Connolly, signed with the A-Roll, but never actually came out and played in Australia because of it. I remember being uh, blown away they got Jason Robinson because he was a yeah. super duper player back then. Yeah. And they might have been able to get even more players, but for the fact that Shane Richardson, then at Cronulla, was on his way to England to sign up some of the New Zealand talent that was playing there to wear a nick out, Richie Barnett. So he was already on his way on unrelated matters, but once Super League executives knew that, they tasked him with signing some of the top English players to Super League agreements. So it was almost the opposite situation in England where they were getting the clubs and officials first and then going after the players. It was always really cool reading the uh, English rugby league magazines in the 90s and reading about Nikau and uh, Tierra Party and mm. just New Zealand guys that didn't play here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were big and you see him in a test once a year or something. Exactly. Nikau especially because he had that mad mullet and the rest <laughs> of it. Like there was this like kind of mythology to him almost or was he a myth and then he came out to australia and proved that yeah real deal yeah realist of deal and so you could consider this signing spree by the arl a failure bob fulton says no it was very successful contrary to what a lot of people think the money that was spent over in england was very well spent what effectively did was a three-prong attack it was to basically put the ante up over there so they had to inject all the money into three clubs so it forced the clubs into a position where they had to go cap in hand to news again over there and they had to put more money in for the players. So again, it's just about destabilizing English rugby league more than... Just, it's just war, <laughs> actual warfare. Yeah. And that's where we'll leave England and move to New Zealand. And I think New Zealand more than England is an example of the ARL reaping what it failed to sow by showing contempt for the international game acting as though they didn't have a responsibility to support weaker leagues. Major oversight. With England, there's a historical holdover where you can see England as the traditional power and being so far away, the ARL didn't necessarily see that they had that responsibility. But for New Zealand, they absolutely should have done more for New Zealand Rugby League. It's insane how competitive they were considering the size of the country, A, and, and the you know amateurish nature of it. Yeah. And they used to compete with us regularly. Yeah, exactly. As Graham Lowe said it when the Warriors were announced, uh, you know, it was a big glitzy affair. And he said, it's funny, I still think of rugby league as the, the blokes who work at the local freezer works and coached <laughs> by Graham Lowe. <laughs> so when they signed, Graham Carden, the boss of the New Zealand Rugby League, came out to Australia and, in the words of Rugby League Week, arrived with a lengthy list of reasons explaining why his board felt no responsibility towards the ARL's position on Super League. And I'll just list some of these. New Zealand not regarded as important by the ARL. Australia has placed obstacles in the way of releasing Kiwis for test duties. Efforts to become involved in the money spinning state of origin program have been repeatedly knocked back. There's only been a half-hearted ARL response to New Zealand's need for regular trans-Tasman tests. ARL officials have repeatedly snubbed their Kiwi counterparts, most recently by refusing to supply any complimentary tickets to this year's Winfield Cup season opener in Auckland. <laughs> like that last one in particular, how petty is that? <laughs> but the one that really intrigues me is that New Zealand efforts to get involved with state of origin being knocked back. And that was from that time on, one of the key carrots from Super League was getting them into that mix. And that is, that's where that 
not Tri Nations, Tri Series. As much as Queensland would like to assert their independence, Tri Series. That Tri Series, yeah. that was in the framework from the moment that New Zealand signed. Uh, looking back on it, the Tri Series sucked as yeah. a concept, but great innovation. No, I think it's a terrible innovation. Well, as a. As, a, oh, uh, as in getting them yeah. to sign, yeah. And as with England, there was no pre existing efforts to get New Zealand involved with Super League. So the only reason it happened when it did was that Graham Lowe, the aforementioned, as well as Trevor McEwen, who we'll hear a bit more about in a minute, saw what was happening in England and went to Super League and said, You'd probably get New Zealand too. I cannot believe that that wasn't, that wasn't even thought about. Super League went so close to botching everything about New Zealand. And this goes back to the raid itself, where they were actually thinking about establishing a team to rival the Warriors. And how are you going to get those players when the best New Zealand players are already playing for the Warriors? Well, how about we go after the All Blacks? Part of This was an idea that David Smith floated to Trevor McEwen. So Trevor McEwen was a New Zealand sports writer, and David Smith used him as a sounding board as to what they could do in New Zealand. To that idea, Trevor McEwen said... It's a Rugby World Cup year, guys. It's probably a bad idea PR-wise to try to steal the All Blacks for Super League. But what about the Warriors? Why don't you just get the Warriors instead of launching a separate team? <laughs> so that that is what happened. And from that point on, Trevor McEwen was recruited to be Super League's key New Zealand contact and had a sizable part to play in the war because of it. And getting the Warriors was a very drama-free affair. It was made drama-free by the ousting of inaugural Warriors chairman Trevor McLeod, who had spoken consistently against privatisation of the New Zealand team and was seen as very loyal to the ARL. So his ousting, which cleared the way for the Warriors to sign with Super League, was organised in part by Dominion Brewery's boss, Brian Blake. Great rugby league man. <laughs> So he was a board member and along with Chief Executive Ian Robson was able to stage a boardroom coup to get McLeod out of the way. That was reported in the Rugby League Week late in 1995. And funnily enough, do you know anything different about that 97 Warriors Super League jersey, Andrew? No, what's that? It had a DB sponsorship on the front. <laughs> so from the outset, they were able to get that sponsorship on the jersey where other teams weren't able to so officially there was a pre-existing relationship which made that mandatory but you can see that maybe there was a quid pro quo yeah and again i don't know that for sure but it seems a possibility at the very least <laughs> so signing the warriors made it very easy to get the new new zealand board and they were signed up without any dramas and again as i said at the start when we were talking about the rep referees the best weapon the Super League had was to capitalize on existing bitterness towards the ARL. We heard Graham Carden rattle off his list of historical grievances. Suddenly, your ARL team's gone to Super League. As a board, you're given this attractive offer. You can get a cash injection into your local comp. You can get a slice of the origin pie. It, it seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Hell yeah. And the ARL's reaction to New Zealand signing only served to reinforce why New Zealand made that decision. So Ken Arthurson on that footy show called Graham Carden's action the greatest act of treachery I've ever come across, which maybe you can argue that's fair enough. But then their response in the aftermath was to threaten to cancel that year's Trans-Tasman Test Series or not release players, the, the very things that the ARL had been accused of doing regularly to New Zealand over the years. And again, I sympathise with Arthurson because I think some of that is just caught up in the moment, making empty threats. Yeah, yeah. And you can also see where he's coming from because the New Zealand signing significantly weakened the ARL's position. That was only made worse by the fact that Super League then went out to sign the rest of the Pacific Nations and leave the ARL completely isolated. The Pacific Nations weren't even anywhere near as strong as they are now then. Yeah, exactly. And... It led to some comical situations. So as Colin Love puts it, it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. All these guys from the Pacific Islands were walking around the foyer of this big hotel and Morris Lindsay and Graham Carden were trying to pull them aside to talk them into going to Super League. We were trying to get them to stay with us. There was lobbying going on everywhere, in the coffee shop, in the foyer, behind pot plants. A couple of years earlier, they couldn't have got arrested. 
Now here they were and everyone wanted them. They were walking around going, how good is this? <laughs> One of those men was uh, Papua New Guinea League boss, Joe Keviame, who, a uh, little bit of trivia, he was the bloke who, when introduced to Bob Fulton, Bob Fulton said, have a go at this bloke's melon. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Do you reckon that contributed to his uh, <laughs> defection? Or... Uh, and then Super League also pulled off the coup of getting Mal Menenga out as part of their recruiting force in the Pacific. You know, Mal, a god in Papua New Guinea, uh, made it a, a fairly easy sell. Better than John Atavaskovic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in typical Mal style, made some regrettable comments about it. <laughs> Jesus. His record is unsurpassed in terrible comments. So this was Norm Tasker writing in the Rugby League Week, quoting ARL administrator Bob Abbott. The thing that really cheesed me off was the Mal Meninga quote in the Super Post. He said Super League had to target the Pacific Islands because they were the feeding grounds for the ARL. Getting them signed with Super League was one way of stopping the channel. Reading that really hurt. This was the last Australian captain saying that. Nothing about doing things for the islands, just shutting out the ARL. So Mal's even gaffing in the Super Post. <laughs> How far do his gaffs go? <laughs> North Pole? What? <laughs> and Bob Abbott from the ARL side is someone that you really have to feel a lot of sympathy for. So he had spent much of the previous decade doing all he could to build up rugby league in the Pacific. And you have to remember that this was, and to some extent still is, rugby union strongholds. The ARL was starting from basically the ground floor, did a lot of work, uh, Abbott in particular, in trying to establish rugby league there and had made significant inroads. Um, this, this comment from that same Rugby League Week article tells part of the story. When I started, they'd hardly heard of Rugby League, and the battle I had to fight against very strong rugby union resistance was intense. But the people there took to league. Slowly, we built up competitions in Fiji, Western Samoa, Tonga, and the Cook Islands. I organised sponsors, small but growing competitions. We sent tapes over and organised some of their players, like Noah Nandruku, to play here. We got teams to go there, like France and Queensland. We made wonderful progress. In depressed economies, the players love the opportunities we could provide. Now Super League comes in and pinches the lot. Mm. But as Norm Tasker counters in that article, maybe the ARL shouldn't have made it just Bob Abbott's little pet project. Yeah. Maybe they should have treated the matter more seriously. It's easy to, to crack the whip in hindsight. It's just It just wasn't thought about back then. No, and that's the thing. You saw it in that Colin Love quote. Mm. It, it wasn't thought about at all. And it's... It's not like the ARL could have foreseen what was going to happen in this instance. So I don't want to be too harsh on them, but it is something to consider that the fact that they you know, laid the foundations but hadn't done much more to strengthen it, again, made it a very easy sell to those you know, rugby league minnows. I'm just loving the fact we've got blokes from Cook Islands, uh, Fiji, all going, how good is this? <laughs> but as a positive, I mean, it wasn't thought about back then, but now look at how... Uh... Mm. The international game's grown. Yeah. And I, I mean, I hope there's a lesson there. And I hope, you know, we, we've seen some turbulence already in the two or three years that the Pacific has really taken off. So, Which means that they're pure rugby league. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, we'll, and we'll survive. <laughs> but it wasn't a complete shutout for the ARL in the Pacific. And I'll let Ian Heads take it from the Sun Herald in June 1995. The ARL's development manager for the Southern Hemisphere, Bob Abbott, announced yesterday that the league would form an Oceania RL association in Fiji's western province. So at least they had that. <laughs> and with that, with this ARL shutout, Super League launched a global conference in Marina del Rey in California. Can we incinerate any more cash? <laughs> to me, this is so emblematic of Super League's attitude towards international football in general. It was style over substance it's like let's make a big splash let's show how strong we are but with no real idea what they're trying to achieve well I mean, was it because the murdochs were in us and it was easy for them to get to or just it was all about image it's got to be all about image you had super league's headquarters in australia you had most of the super league member nations a short distance from australia they should have had it at the could you be hotel yeah. <laughs> every rugby league people would have been much happier and at that conference, they launched their international plan, which immediately caused concern about what they were trying to achieve internationally. 
and maybe the new board was going to be same as the old board. So one of the main reasons that New Zealand signed was that they wanted to play more regular uh, trans-Tasman football against Australia. There were no tests against New Zealand on the slate for 1996. The two tests New Zealand did have were against Great Britain, uh, set down for October 27, nearly two months after the Super League regular season season was scheduled to end. Well, wow. And I mean, Super League never got the chance to prove their credentials, but the little we saw over the next couple of years didn't go very well. So uh, maybe it's being a bit harsh to say that they wouldn't have had a concerted effort to fix international football, but... It was on the cards. <laughs> <laughs> but the end result was the same. And this John Rebo quote sums up what they were able to achieve. Super League is now the only rugby league competition in the world with real international ties. The ARL stands alone as the only administrative body which has refused to see the good sense and financial viability of joining Super League. The attitude of the Pacific nations was exciting. They want their kids to play rugby league and we are going to help with that. Might be the one positive out of the whole war, the jump-starting of the Pacific Revolution. It might be, but I don't want to necessarily give Super League the credit for that. I mean... It's it, definitely an afterthought yeah. on everyone's part, but it, they still might have been wallowing in rugby union if it wasn't for this yeah, jump-start. Yeah, exactly. Um, and when I say I don't want to give them the credit, it's because I haven't explored the matter enough. So if anyone does have some insight to add to this, I'd love to hear it. Mm. But it's something we'll certainly uh, examine as we go along with this series. But this is where the ARL found itself at the end of this week, a week that started so well for them and managed to turn back the tide so much so that it seemed that Super League was not going to get off the ground. Suddenly, by the end of that first week, they're incredibly weakened and that position would only get worse internationally over the rest of the year. So that's where we leave this chapter. Uh, I'm going to do uh, the book plug of the week and it is Bill Harrigan's book, Harrigan. Great book. It's a really good book and if you were or are like me and had that hack perspective on Bill Harrigan, this book really helped to alter my perspective of him. You could see how passionate he was about refereeing and what an yeah. advocate he's been. Yeah. You, you know, I didn't agree with all his decisions on the field. I don't agree with all his statements since he retired from being a referee, but he's fighting for referees, which is something sorely needed. It's hard to say, but the book is its just very Bill Harrigan. The yeah. book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. It really is. Love Bill Harrigan. Uh, and th this represents a mini milestone for us as a podcast because we have reached the end of the April Fool's section. Woo! <laughs> so this is the most concentrated period of the war. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming up in uh, future chapters. When I say we've reached the end of the April Fool's section, the next few chapters are going to cover the weeks immediately after April <laughs> Fool's. So we're not getting too far ahead. Uh, but this is definitely the end of one section of this show. Well, it's been 22 episodes and I only found out about this podcast on April <laughs> Fool's. So I'm surprised. Uh, so next week, you won't have the next chapter, but you will have four podcasts coming out from us. So we're going to be releasing the audio of the Tom Brock Rugby League Reflections Conference, which I attended last week, which was such a magnificent day of rugby league and so excited and privileged to be able to share it to the RLD listeners. So 12 presentations covering all aspects of rugby league. We're going to release those on four consecutive days next week. Uh, we'll be back with the next Super League chapter of the week after that. So uh, yeah, a lot's coming up from us in the next couple of weeks. Look out for that. I'm so looking forward to the Olsen Filipano chat. That was... Uh, that was my favorite one of the day that it was ties in a lot with what we've talked about today. So look out for that one and all the rest of it. As always, we would really love to hear your thoughts of what we talked about today. This particularly goes out to our English listeners. We hear from you guys a lot, but this is your chance to give us some insight. Yeah. So I, I really love, especially people who were there at the time, or, you know, maybe had a traditional club tie that whose position was under threat. How were you feeling at the time? I, I watched Castleford v Hunter Mariners at Topper Stadium and that, that a travelling contingent of, you know, 50 Castleford fans, mm. the most passionate, loud, uh, loyal fans. And like, it always stuck with me how good the North of England fans yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. So we love it. So we'd love to hear any of your thoughts as well as everyone else listening. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, you tuning in every week. Uh, if you do enjoy the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to the Rugby League Digest. Uh, and we will speak to you next week. Toodaloo.